Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have a very special show for you folks today. Uh, first ever live podcast. Well, maybe not live because you're listening and watching a recording of it, but we have a live audience. We are here with the Knox County Master Gardeners, uh, and they are our audience. They're watching us record this right now. So thank you very much, Master Gardeners, for being here. We do appreciate your your time and letting us kind of jump in on your meeting for this month. So um, we have quite a, a full show for you tonight. We have Candace Hart. Candace, she is the uh, State Master Gardener Specialist here uh, with uh, University of Illinois Extension. But before we get to Candace, let us introduce our co host here every single week. We have Katie Parker, local foods educator in Adams County. Hello, Katie. Hello, Chris. How's it going? Oh, not too bad. I'm, I'm here in my basement. And as, <laughs> uh, as I hit the go on the record button, I realized I left the door open. And so you can hear all of the dinner making sounds that are happening right now. So I'll probably run and close that here in a bit, but uh, you know, well, I'll take care of that if in makes, a second. If it makes you feel any better, I can't hear it. All yeah, right. me neither. Perfect. So I, can. I think you're good. <laughs> I can't. I'm just waiting for the screaming to start. So <laughs> and then my kids will start getting upset, you know. So, <laughs> so um, we're also joined by horticulture educator Ken Johnson. Ken is in Jacksonville, Illinois. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris and Katie. How are you? You know, how are you doing, Katie? You know how I'm doing. <laughs> I'm doing well. I mean, it's five o'clock. Uh, you know, getting ready for dinner, thinking about some plants, house plants. Who doesn't love a house plants? We're going to have an awesome show. I know. So yeah, we're going to be talking house plants today and it's probably a good thing because, you know, we've had some cold nights recently, but I think last night, um, we're recording this, uh, Monday, November 2nd. So last night, um, we got down to 20 degrees and, some of my outdoor plants, like our coleus and things that we just left up, they were still up, but this morning they were toast. So I think last night finally got all of our tender outdoor plants. Same with everybody. Yeah, same here. I think the the, the last remaining holdouts finally got toasted last night. Yeah. 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 yeah my yeah. peanuts and cotton are no more. Oh, no. <laughs> we've been okay. So folks, if uh, you know anything about the podcast, we've been following Ken's peanuts and cotton crop all season <laughs> long. So Ken, give us an update while yeah. I go close my door. <laughs> so I've got I got lots of cotton I need to pick a lot of the bowls have opened up. Um, so I need to go out and pick those. I have not picked peanuts yet. So I need to go out tomorrow since that's election day and we have off. I'm going to go out and, and harvest my peanuts and get those dried and then roast them eventually. So Exciting. that's, that's the plan going forward. Anyway, I'll have to report back to see what my, uh, peanut yields were, but, yeah. uh, um, is this your first year doing peanuts first time? Yes. Sweet. Yep. And then, um, with the cotton, we got, we got a surprising amount of cotton off of those. So we'll probably do cotton again next year. That was a fun plant to grow. Very cool. Yeah. I, I would be super excited to try cotton. I think Ken has talked me into it for next year. So that's, it's, it's on the list. What are you going to do with it, Ken? Are you going to like decorate with it? It's probably going to sit in some <laughs> fiber and clay dust probably. <laughs> <laughs> but our oldest son wanted to grow it. So we, each year we let one of the kids pick something to grow and he wanted to try cotton this year. So cool. we've been having him try to pick all the seeds out. <clears throat> which is which is a pain to get all the seeds out of them but keep we don't have any definitive plans keep them yeah. occupied for a while he was he was sticking them in his ear using his ear protection <laughs> <laughs> that's one use <laughs> there you go. i was thinking fire starter but yeah ear, ear plugs <laughs> works. Let's get a couple seeds in there though ouch so our special guest tonight is candace hart candace is the state master gardener uh, specialist. Am I saying your title right? Because I keep wanting to say yep. coordinator, but I know. I mean, same thing, just yep, different name. Yep. <laughs> Can Candace is the overlord of Master Gardeners here in Illinois. Overlord. I try. I try. I don't know what that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <I don't> know. <laughs> so thank you, Candace, for being on the show today. Yeah, happy to be on. I'm excited. 
And so we're, we're going to talk about houseplants, but I want to, I want to cover a little bit about the Master Gardener program before we dive into our main topic tonight. So, yeah. um, you know, I know that things have been difficult in terms of Master Gardener training and getting together and having projects and all of that, but um, you have some online training opportunities coming up. So uh, would, would you mind just explaining to uh, the audience and people listening and watching about uh, you know, how are we reaching folks now in terms of Master Gardener training? Yeah, excellent question. And yeah, it's been a crazy year, as we all know. So um, one great thing about the Master Gardener program is we've had some kind of virtual online options in place uh, before COVID hit. So we were a little bit prepared for for some things because um, obviously master gardener trainings have been a little bit difficult this year because a lot of our uh, master gardeners are educated at face-to-face -face classroom kind of style trainings which I'm sure a lot of the Knox folks on the call that's probably how they were were trained and certainly we can't do that right now we can't be in offices we can't be in groups um, so we've had a really big increase in our online training options. A lot of folks have uh, hopped on that option because it's completely online. It's totally self-paced. So it, it has the same content as our face-to-face -face training. There's still all of the great topics. Um, but what's nice is that they can do it at any pace they want to. So if someone is really gung ho, you could complete Master Gardener training in a week if you really wanted to. I wouldn't recommend that, but but you but you could. So we have that online option continuing, and we actually have 200. Uh, plus folks in the fall class right now, which is a big increase in what we usually have. And we're also now working on kind of a hybrid uh, model uh, too, where it's a little bit less self-paced, but you're still doing a lot of the activities and the work at home. Uh, and then you're getting on a live call kind of once a week uh, to still kind of stay connected with your group. So yeah, that's been really exciting and fun. Just some new models that we're trying out. And I, you guys are involved in the content and creation. So I'm excited about that to see, see where it goes. Yeah, I think that's a really good opportunity. And I know just, you know, times being what they are, um, you know, I, I feel like it, it, we are still able to get that knowledge and that that education component out and, and training new volunteers so that when the day comes, when we can go out and volunteer, <laughs> Um, we can do that. And I, I know that there are some master gardeners that are able to still work on a few projects here in limited numbers. Um, and sometimes the project does not necessarily involve being out in the public. Sometimes it is creating presentations, information sheets, things like that. So it's, yeah, um, yeah there's still a lot of work happening. Uh, it's just, it's a little bit more coordination and strategy goes into it. Yeah, looks a little bit different. And there's there's even some projects, like you said, they're, they're doing things at home, whether it's creating educational content, or there's some volunteers who are even growing produce at home to donate to, uh, to food pantries. So yeah, it's definitely been a, it's been a hard year because there's been less opportunities, but it's been great to see Master Gardener still sticking with it and staying with the program and doing what they can to stay safe and still kind of help their communities. So it's been really good. Well, thank you, Candace, so much for, you know, organizing, especially these statewide efforts uh, for these training uh, so that so that we can continue to do the good work and extend the knowledge of the university out into the communities. Yep. Help others learn to grow. That's what we got to do. Right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, exactly. I, I have to ask you, Candace, you know, we always you're a new guest on the Good Growing Podcast. So we always ask the new guest, Why? <laughs> Why did you choose horticulture? What, what brought you into the position role that you fill now at U of I Extension? Give us a bit about sure. you. Excellent question. And I would say two things kind of brought me uh, to where I'm at today. First of those being 4-H. Now this isn't like they didn't pay me to to say this, but <laughs> but I was in 4-H since I was uh, eight years old. I did it all the way from the start. I always took gardening and horticulture as one of the the projects every year. Floral design, always did that every year. Always loved it, um, but always thought I wanted to be an elementary school teacher. I always knew I wanted to teach. Uh, but I don't think my mind knew there was more options beyond just teaching school kids. 
So eventually then I got to high school and was lucky enough to have a great ag program at the high school I was at and they had a horticulture class. It was like a, it was a short, I think one quarter class, but uh, I took it, I loved it and I aced it. It just came super easy <laughs> to me. And I'm like, well, this could be, this could be great. I really like this. So then I just started kind of researching more of what the options would be for that in horticulture in terms of um, could I work in a greenhouse? Could I work in a landscape? Could I teach? What could I do? Um, yeah, so just kind of started researching from there and ended up at a community college horticulture program. Took a lot of those kind of introductory horticulture classes and still at that point knew I wanted to teach still. So at that point I was thinking, oh, I'll teach maybe a high school ag program and kind of go from there. But then eventually decided after I got my bachelor's to go ahead and get my master's so that I could with the ultimate goal of teaching either at a community college or working in extension, which is what I ended up doing. The timing worked out uh, almost oh, perfectly for me. Extension had reorganized right before I was graduating uh, grad school, like I think you and Ken were about the same time. Um, yeah, and then started right out as a horticulture educator and never looked back. Loved it ever since. Yeah, I, I do think that in terms of horticulture, it seems like it's someone or something in the classroom, uh, mm -hmm. you know, has inspired someone. I, I, I think with my start, it was uh, when I was a young child, my mom just would give me a shovel and I would dig holes all day. And so I became a landscaper. Yeah. There you <laughs> go. I can dig <laughs> holes. There you go. <laughs> so nice. Candace, we have you here today because um, like I said, it's gotten cold outside. We brought a lot of our plants in. So, um, you know, if, if anyone uh, watching the, the live version here, Master Gardeners, if you have questions, houseplants, feel free to throw those in the chat box. We can get to those. But I want to ask you, Candace, how many houseplants do you have? You know, I was thinking about this when I was hopping on. I didn't actually count. I would say probably in the house, maybe 15 to 20 ish, probably. Not a huge amount, I would say, in terms of houseplant lovers, but not a small amount either. I am. So we, we moved recently, mm -hmm. and our house we had before was much smaller. Mm. And now our house is bigger. And I have, I think I've bit off more than I can chew. So <laughs> I have way too many. I have lemon how, trees, how rubber many? trees. I got jade plants. It's to the right. You can't see it right now, but it's like, <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. So how many are we talking here? Um, uh, there's like five here and there's probably 20 more scattered throughout the house. Um, I have probably 10 to 20 in the garage still. And I have been cracking my garage door open the door to the house. So it gets a little warm to keep them warm <laughs> at night. And my heating bill is probably really high, but yeah. you know, you know, it's worth it. You know, house plants. You, yeah. you gotta, you gotta yeah. have them all. Yeah. That doesn't include that. So that would be inside the house. That doesn't include my succulent collection, mm. I would say, which is like you in the garage kind of with grow lights, yep. just f chilling out for the winter before I can take it back outside for the, the summer, basically. And the, Katie, are you, are you got any, I, there's some plant back there in the background. Yeah, I what, saw what, that. You got any house plants uh, at your home now? I know you've just moved as well, so. Yeah, so I'm a, a lover of house plants. I have a corn plant right next to me. There's a <laughs> pepperomania behind me. Um, I actually got told by my boyfriend a few weeks ago that I need to scale it down <laughs> because there's no room to put other things, which I totally disagree. No. Um, yeah. yeah, there's always room for more house plants. Yeah. And every time you get to the store, if there's one dying, you have to take it home. So, uh, yeah, I love house plants. It's just, um, it's nice to see something green, you know growing in your house. I think the only downside about where we are now is we don't have a whole lot of sunlight. Um, so I've been finding like spaces where we have some good sunlight and usually I'll move most of the plants to that area uh, when we don't have company over. And then when we have people over, I'll move them to their homes. Uh, so that way they're a little more prettier. But. Instagram worthy when people yeah, come there over. There you go. <laughs> nice. 
And Ken has an interesting strategy when it comes to houseplants over the winter. It, what, what was that, Ken? You wouldn't have the heat on if it weren't for the houseplants, right? <laughs> Pretty much. It would be much colder in our house if we didn't have houseplants. I figure people in the, in the pets can generate their own body heat, but plants, not so much. So we usually we keep the house about 65 or so. I'd probably keep it low 60s, upper 50s if we didn't have plants, but nice i couldn't do that that's that's too much <laughs> or too, not too much too low or too yeah little. yeah yeah gotta Maybe, do what do, you gotta do i guess so yeah <laughs> i mean look at his beard though it i mean he's a viking he's through warm. and through he's got warmth yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everyone just wants to hug him he's so warm <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah in an ideal world i would have a uh, a nice greenhouse attached to the back of my house where I could just kind of put all these and grow my own little jungle going on there. But, you know, we, I don't have that. I don't think any of us do, unfortunately. So Candace, as I am moving these houseplants inside, um, I'm picking up a lot of leaves. There's a lot of yellowing. Some, some tip burn is happening. Um, is this normal? What should I be expecting right now? Yeah, all normal things. Because when you think about it, anytime you're changing a plant's environment in any way, you're going to have some signs of that show up, whether that's, like you said, leaves dropping and yellowing. Um, anytime you're changing the environmental conditions, you can kind of expect a period where, uh, at least I've found in most cases, where the plant's going to look pretty sad for a while until it gets acclimated to that new spot, those new conditions. And then I find they kind of eventually kind of bounce out back from that. So usually when I, I do tend to put a lot of things out for the summer, if I can, just to kind of get them more sunlight, get more warmth, get some less clutter <laughs> in the house for the summer. Uh, and then like you, I usually take them from outside and bring them to the garage first um one so that any like critters in there can kind of work their way out if they might be lingering in the uh in the soil um but then yeah just to kind of slowly transition them a little bit in terms of lower temperatures less light less humidity and then after i leave them in the garage for a bit if they're ones that i want to bring in to the house fully then i'll go ahead and bring them into the house at at that point. So I found the if you can do a little bit more of a slower transition, um, it tends to uh, to help a little bit in terms of that kind of shock period of moving them in and out. And, you so too. and we we're going to be talking about house plants all night and at our heart, we are a question and answer show folks. So we do have a couple questions coming in from our our live audience right now are Knox County awesome. Master Gardeners. So Katie, you want to kick us off with our first question? Yeah, so our first question comes from Marilyn and she's wondering, she keeps her outdoor plants alive through March and then she loses them. She's not really a great indoor plant person. Why do you think that she's losing them when she's almost there? Yeah, that's a tough one because I think it could be a couple of factors. Um, I think for the most part, it's just those plants are really starting to run out of juice. Like they're ready to get some more light going as the days are getting longer. They need more light, more fertilizer, more water as they're starting to come out of dormancy. Um, and I think if you're not giving them those conditions yet, like if you're still trying to treat them kind of as they're dormant still, they may just be kind of fizzling out. They're not getting the requirements that they're needing as they're coming out of dormancy. That would be my kind of thinking. What would, would you guys uh, have anything else to add on that? I, I would agree. Probably it's time to start picking up the watering, increase the light levels yeah. a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you could throw in a supplemental light, um, these new, there's new like LED fixtures, things like that, that are low energy use, uh, you know, low heat output, but they can generate some decent uh, light. You know, maybe throw one of those near or on the plant to up that light level. That's probably time for a dose of house plant fertilizer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if you think about it, as the, the days are starting to get a little bit longer, the temperatures are starting to get warmer, that's triggering those plants that, okay, it's time to come out of dormant season and get back into that kind of growing uh, period. So if we don't have the conditions there for them to go through that, then 
that's a that's tough for him. You might lose him, yeah. Good question, Marilyn. All right, then our next question from our live studio audience is from Melinda. Um, she wants to know, is it better to water a house plant by soaking from the bottom or add to the top of the soil? Excellent question as well. And I would say it depends on the root system in that pot. So if it's a, let's say it's a newly planted house plant and um, there's a lot of, you've added fresh soil, the, the roots aren't fully kind of to the bottom of the pot yet, or they're not fully filling that pot, then I would stick with a watering at the top of the soil method. But if it's a more established house plant where the roots have filled that entire um, pot, um, then certainly, yeah, the bottom watering method where you have a tray below, you fill that with water and you let the roots and the soil soak it up from the bottom is a great way to do it. Key factor there is just to make sure, let it soak for a couple hours, but after that, if there's still water left in the tray, to dump that out. Because uh, the key is that you want it to, to soak up that water, but you don't want it to sit in excess water for a long period of time. I'll tell you personally, I water almost all of mine from the top, um, partly just because that's the type of containers a lot of mine are in. They're not really, uh, I don't have trays under a lot of them or I don't have a type of container that I could do that easily. Um, so I don't tend to do that too often, but I know a lot of, a lot of house planters do. Do you, do you have like a watering strategy like once a week or um, how do you know? Wind to water. Excellent. Yeah, excellent question. I see people, you know, if you're on Instagram, you're watching your stories, you see a lot of people talking about their bought their house plants and they'll be like, oh, it's it's water Wednesday or it's house plant Tuesday or whatever, and they have kind of a schedule that they remember to water, which I think is good in terms of remembering to check your house plants. Uh, but we always tell people that you can't necessarily water on the schedule because the conditions are going to be different every uh, every week. So for me, I tend to kind of have, honestly, I don't have a schedule. If I did, it'd be great. And like on Tuesdays, I could walk around and check my house plants and see <laughs> see how they are. But I'll be honest, I don't. I don't have any. I don't have any type of schedule. It's just when I <laughs> remember. Um, but once a week, you could go around and stick your finger in the top of the soil, stick your finger on the bottom of the pot, lift it up, feel how heavy it is uh, to kind of gauge if it's ready for, for water yet. Um, I think a lot of people that follow that schedule over time, they may end up overwatering a particular house plant because they're not necessarily checking if it needs it or not. They're just watering because it's it's the day to water. And I think a lot of us know that the easiest way to kill a house plant is to to overwater uh, for sure. So I myself am probably a cereal underwaterer. I water very, very limited, mostly because I forget, but also because <laughs> I, I know I don't want to overwater. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times I don't water until they start wilting. Right. <laughs> just, which is not good either. Until it but. shows me it needs water. I'm not going to water. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we also have a question about Boston ferns. Should they be cut back prior to bringing them inside? Totally up to you. I've done it either way where I've left it full and lush and and big and had it as a house plant uh, for the winter or I've done it the other way where I've immediately kind of cut it back when I brought it in and let it leaf back out uh, from there. To be honest, personal preference for me, it would be to cut it back when I bring it in just because it's so messy as a house plant. They shed, they're beautiful, they have a big lush Boston fern, but for me, they just, they drop a lot of leaves and it's just a messy uh, kind of house plant to deal with. So I do tend to like to um, cut it back. And it kind of depends on your goal. Like if you're wanting it to keep it green and lush and beautiful, then don't cut it back. But if you're just bringing it in to save it until you can put it back out for the next season, then I would just cut it back so that you're dealing with less, less plant material to uh, kind of keep alive for the next season. That's what I do. 
now I have a strategy for at least uh, two of my plants in the garage. <laughs> and I don't, I'll just cut them back and I won't cut have to back. deal with them. Yeah. Cut it back. And you can divide at that point too. Uh, I've done that too, where I've, I've cut it back and then I've divided one like hanging basket into four. And then by the time spring comes and they're ready to go back out again, uh, you're kind of ready to go with new, new ferns. All right. So our next question, um, what should we do about pots without drainage holes? Ooh, don't overwater. That's what you should do. <laughs> Be really careful with your watering um, schedule. Um, or the other alternative would be to try to make a drainage hole if you can. It kind of depends what the material is, but I've taken lots of containers and just put a drill bit on a drill and drilled my own holes if it works. Uh, it doesn't work so good for like a ceramic container that's a little trickier. Um, but you certainly can have houseplants without drainage holes in the pot. You just have to be really careful to not overwater because there's nowhere for that excess water to go. So really make sure that it is dried out before um, you go ahead and water again. Or you might also put a plant in a container like that that enjoys being a little bit more on the wet side too. Maybe you, um, let's say you want to have a bog garden and do some Venus fly traps, something like that. That'd be perfect for something like that. Or you could do like a, a pot in a pot if it's more of a decorative. That too. More of a decorative look. Yeah, I've done that with like baskets where you, you put the plastic container inside and then when it comes to watering, you can pull out the plant, water it in the sink and then put it back in the basket. Absolutely. So in addition to that question, if you have a pot with dr no drainage holes, would you recommend that people put gravel in the bottom of those pots? Uh, to help with drainage? Good question. And the answer would be no. Um, there's a, I have a good graphic in one of my PowerPoints um, from some other ex state extension. I can't remember which one, but basically it's a nice graphic that you have your, your roots, uh, your soil filling the pot. You have that layer of, of rock on the bottom. And what the photo shows is just a film of water sitting kind of right on top of that rock uh, layer. Um, Cause you might think that that's gonna improve drainage and the water's just gonna go right through that gravel. But what'll actually happen is it'll just pool right at the bottom of the soil where it meets the, the gravel. So essentially all you're doing is you're just decreasing your root zone, um, which is not gonna help the health of your plant. So for me, no, no need to add gravel or any type of drainage, pop cans, diapers, whatever crazy things people put in, in, in pots. Use um, diapers. <laughs> yeah, even, wor even worse. Um, <laughs> No need, just fill that baby up with potting soil and give that plant as much root space as, as possible. I know you might spend a little bit more on potting mix, but it, for the health of that plant, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be worth it. Would you guys agree? Yeah, I, I'd agree. I, I'll never forget the demonstration our professor in our, I think it was General Hort 101, showed us um, how you can have a perched water table when you have two different soil textures yeah and he used an aquarium big gravel stones in the bottom sand on top and he just showed how the sand column filled with water and saturated before it moved down into that gravel layer so that's that was a, a very I, I thought it was a fascinating moment i'm like water's magic you know it's <laughs> it's so cool yeah. uh so yeah definitely but nice. there's a big misconception you see it mm -hmm. all the time on social oh, yeah. media yeah yeah Yep, exactly. And I don't know what it is. If it's if it's a cost issue that they don't want to have as much potting soil or if they really think it's going to help the drainage. I don't know. But yeah, you see it all the time. I think it might be like pore space, you know, like you have larger pore space with your gravel and people think that that will attract mm -hmm. the water, but it's not that, what's happening. Yeah, not quite. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question, though. I see that a lot. All right. Next question we have is about rosemary. Um, uh, we've learned that you should water rosemary and keep a tray underneath so that the roots absorb, uh, but roots don't like to be in water. So what's kind of the best way to handle overwintering rosemary? That's a good question. I would say bottering, bottom watering would probably be good for like a nice established uh, rosemary pot. But like you said, just like we said earlier, don't leave the water sitting in the tray so that the soil is sitting in water. What you would do or what you could do instead is actually 
have a tray filled with gravel, not in the pot, in a tray, have your gravel in the, in the tray. And what you can do is set the pot then on the gravel and you can fill water within that gravel. So the pot is just sitting on the gravel. It's not actually sitting on the water. And what that can do is it can help increase your humidity because I've found ras raspberry, rosemary can be tough at, to grow as a house plant because of our heating systems in our homes. It just dries the air out so much. And uh, I found the rosemary just do not appreciate kind of a low humidity uh, environment. So sometimes like grouping those plants together and doing that trick with the tray of gravel and water um, could be helpful. But yeah, rosemary, I've had some success as a house plant, but I'm usually not attentive enough to, <laughs> to keep it going. It doesn't meet my toughness standards as a, as a house plant. <laughs> And that, and that clumping and that gravel is good for other house plants too, not just yeah. rosemary. Oh, yeah. especially. And that can help with that, you know, bringing them in and then transitioning them to that lower humidity kind of help ease that. Mm -hmm. We'll yeah. just you know, get quite as much leaf drop. For sure. Yeah. Speaking of toughness of plants, <laughs> do you have any suggestions of plants that would do well in a low light house? Yeah. So those are my favorite kind of house plants. Those are like indestructible, black thumb, like don't need any light, basically house plants. That, that's my go-to <laughs> house plant. So let's see, some of my favorites would be um, snake plant or mother-in-law's tongue. You could drop a bomb on that baby and it would still, <laughs> still go. I love that guy. Very tall, skinny, uh, vertical leaves. Uh, pothos, devil's ivy, uh, and philodendrons are another one that I love, especially if you want that kind of trailing, coming down uh, kind of growth. Um, ZZ plant, excellent, uh, tough um, house plant. Um, trying to think where el what else I've got in like the tough spots. I've got ZZ plant in the middle. Uh, I usually can test if it's something that's in the middle of a room, it's the farthest from a window and it's still looking good. Those are going to be my favorites. So that's my ZZ and my snake plant. I've got some prayer plants um, too that will tolerate that uh, pretty good. What else? Can you guys think of any, any, uh, any other ones? I know I'm spacing on a couple. Those are the ones that come to mind for me, but I am far from a house plant expert. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Chinese evergreen does pretty mm. well. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. See, my the rubber tree that I propagated at SIU has tolerated summers of not being watered at all um, and being nice. outside. I don't know how tough it is. It also has the same pothos that I propagate. It's all from propagation class. Yeah. Um, and it has survived me for over, what has it been now? Fifth, almost 15 years. So nice. if you can survive me for 15 years, <laughs> those plants and my wife, way to go. Way yeah. to go. Good job. They're, they're in my, they're in my tough plant category. There you go. Yeah. You'd think us as horticulturists, we would be growing like the most finicky, like really cool house plants. But I found that most of us are like, nah, if it, if it can't survive, <laughs> if it can't survive on its own, we're not growing it. <laughs> that's, we, that's kind of how I am with house plants. <laughs> I always feel like we see too many of the, the problems with plants. We're just like, we don't, we don't even want to try it. No, don't, yeah. don't risk well, it. Yeah, we know how much work it's going to take to to keep it at its maximum life. So it's like, nah, we don't have time for that. <laughs> That's why we go to botanic gardens to see right. those. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so since we're talking about killing houseplants, how many houseplants have you killed in your, in your life? Oh, geez. Uh, too many to count for sure. Houseplant wise, probably not, not an extreme amount, probably house went ways because I know which ones are going to be the toughest. And like, I've, I've been selective on the ones I'm going to, um, I'm going to pick. So probably not too crazy on the houseplant front, everything else though. Oh yeah. Tons. <laughs> That's the fun part though, is experimenting and see what, see what's going to happen. Yeah. I, we had some extra succulents, um, from a program and I'm just like, I want to see where this will survive. So I planted them in just horrible locations and they didn't survive. So now I know. <laughs> you proved your hypothesis. There you go. That's <laughs> science. 
Yeah, succulents are definitely one of my, that's one of my favorite groups of plants. It's, like you said, it's a little trickier as a house plant because you need a good, bright, sunny window. Um, but that's why I grow them outside basically all season from April to October and then stick them in a dark corner with some grow lights for the winter and just try to get them to survive until I can put them back outside again. That's basically how I do it. When repotting plants, um, if you don't want to move to a larger pot size, would you suggest trimming the roots or is that a bad thing to do? I think you definitely could. I think it depends. It depends what the plant is and how like pot bound it is. So if you pull something out and if you've got roots really circling, big, thick, heavy roots, um, and if the plant is still healthy and it's still thriving in that condition, I would honestly leave it if we're talking about a, a house plant, because there, there are certain ones that kind of thrive and prefer to be pot bound. Um, that also helps you to not overwater if there's a lot of roots, uh, roots in there. Um, to be on, to be honest, unless the plant is kind of showing decline or it's not flowering or, uh, it's really struggling, um, you probably don't need to repot it in the, in the first place. Uh, but you could certainly trim some roots if they're coming out of drainage holes, if they're coming out of the pot. Yeah, absolutely. You could. Yeah. Um, and a good tip for if you are going to repot, if you feel like it's time to repot, don't go too crazy on your pot size. Only grow, go up a couple of inches um, in pot size because when you have a lot of bare soil that doesn't have any roots growing in it yet, that's also a great opportunity for you to overwater. So that soil is going to stay wet for a longer period of time when you have more soil. So if you increase your soil mass and you stay on the same watering schedule, that's when kind of problems can can start to. So again, as a tough houseplant horticulturist, I pretty rarely repot unless it really looks like it needs needs to, or it's really growing out of the pot like crazy. You find a nicer pot. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Good question. All right, so one common problem I think we've all heard about um, is the kind of that leaf tip burn or those margins burning um, on houseplants. What's going on? with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think we see that a lot. Some plants more than others, and it could be a couple factors. It could be your water, uh, the type of water. Um, some plants are sensitive to fluoride. So if you're using tap water straight away to, to water your plants right out of the sink, um, that could cause a little bit of browning. Spider plant is one I can think of, for example, that can get that fluoride uh, brown tip damage. Uh, humidity can be another thing if you're noticing the the edges are getting a little bit crispy and you're watering right you've got the right watering schedule going um, that could be a sign that the humidity is a little bit low so you can group them together use the the gravel um, trick uh, or on the flip side it also could mean that maybe you're watering a little bit too little that the the leaves are drying out and you may need to water a little bit more so it's not really a simple answer there. It could be a couple of a uh, couple of different factors, unfortunately. Uh, but hopefully, you can rule out some of those based on kind of how you're watering and what the type of uh, of plant is. I love, for example, I love spider plant. It's an super easy to grow um, house plant. I've had it. I had it in my window boxes out in the front of my house all um, summer long. It was a really tough uh, plant to have in the window boxes. Um, and I decided I wanted to save them and bring them inside because, you know, you want to save them and not have to buy them again the next year. Uh, but of course, the second I brought them in and started watering with regular um, tap water, and then they start to look brown and, and great. When they had rainwater outside, they were glorious. <laughs> but once they brought them inside, humidity changes, water changes. Uh, now they look pretty, pretty darn sad. So could be a couple of things going on there. And relating to our watering again, um, sometimes we see like the white particles on our potting soil surface. What's going on with that and what is it? 
Yeah, if it's like a, a crusted layer, like almost like a crystallized uh, kind of layer on the top, then you're probably looking at some fertilizer uh, buildup. Um, if it's just like kind of white particles in the soil, that could just be the uh, perlite that's in your, your potting mix. But if it is an actual kind of crystallized almost layer on the top, then you probably have fertilizer buildup, meaning that you're fertilizing a little bit too often. So whether you're using any type of houseplant fertilizer, any of the brands, you want to always kind of follow the rate on the, the package, make sure you're diluting it properly and following kind of the once a month or however much they recommend um, schedule. Uh, if you do notice that, if you have that buildup happening, basically what you wanna do is start to flush that out. So normally we, you wouldn't recommend you do this, but you could put your, your plant in the sink, really let the water run through it, let it go out that drainage hole and flush out that extra fertilizer, just making sure to let it dry out very good before you go ahead and water um, the next time. Again, as a, a lazy houseplant horticulturist, I very rarely fertilize. So I don't have that problem too much either. <laughs> Wait for the next thunderstorm and lightning to get the nitrogen to the plants. There you go. That's yeah. all you need. That's all you need. So, so there's a moral of the stories there is that your plants will survive without additional fertilizer. They may thrive a little bit more and be a little bit more lush, grow a little faster if you do fertilize. Uh, but I'm, I'm a shining example is that you don't have to fertilize. They will keep moving, <laughs> keep moving along. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do, right? <laughs> I think the technical term for that white stuff is white crusties. White crusties. Do you yeah. say it? <laughs> <laughs> white crusties well and as an as an insect guy if you have white fuzzies or white crusties on other parts of the plant then you're talking about that's, something else yes, right that's 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 no good that's you're in trouble then <laughs> if it's, it's on to, the soil that's something else <laughs> yes. yeah if it's on your plants it's time to do some cleaning or or start doing some treatment yeah yeah because then we're talking about mealybug right yeah, or scale yeah yeah or scale yeah if you, have, if you have black crusties on your leaves, then you've got mealybugs or scale, your powdery mildew, or not your powdery, your sooty mold growing on there. Yeah. Just so look Ken, out for all the crusties. What, what's the remedy, Ken? For? For, um, let's say you, you brought mealybug into your, your house plants. So you could go through and try to kind of clean those off. Um, I've done that. You just kind of get a sponge and, and wipe stuff off, kind of scrape them off. Um, then you could treat them with some kind of systemic uh, insecticide. Just make sure it's labeled for indoor use on, on plants and stuff. You don't want to use something that's labeled for outdoor use because that's the label is the law. So make sure you're following that label. Kind of same thing with scale. We've got a, a chef layer that's covered in scale. So we go in mm -hmm. and it's got leaves sometimes end up being black because of all the, the city mold and stuff. So we just go in with a sponge, wipe all the leaves down and then... <clears throat> treat it so that was our was one of our summer activities this year was was cleaning off the leaves of our chef layer so that nice. that reminds me i was just the, so dirty leaves i was looking at my rubber tree right back here um should i be like washing the dust should i be dusting my plants is that something people do kind of bothers me so i want to do it i don't know should i <laughs> i I don't. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe if I had something with like a really broad leaf, like a rubber tree like that, and I noticed a, a layer of dust on it, I, I would. Uh, but, you know, again, I'm a lazy houseplant horticulturist, so I don't, so I don't, so I don't. Mm -hmm. but probably a good idea if you are noticing a, a dust layer on the, on the top of your leaves. I'll just It'll be set fine. it outside next year. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. The, wind, the wind will blow it right off. Yeah. <laughs> you can write your name on it. It's time to wash it. <laughs> I can, can like dust, wash me. <laughs> can dust be used as like a natural fungicide and insecticide? Mm, Physical barrier. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There go. Science work. experiment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it could work. Well, in in on Ken's note talking about control, I just want to uh, let people know too is that 
there's no shame in starting over sometimes too. If you, if you have a house plant and especially if it doesn't have sentimental value or if it doesn't have a lot of uh, value to you, um, controls obviously are, are, are a great way to do it. But if you've tried controls, you've tried several methods and it's still not get, c getting control of let's say mealybug or scale, sometimes you just start over with a, a new variety, <laughs> a new plant. I've had to do that many times before. Yeah, house plants aren't usually terribly expensive. So mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes you end up spending more trying to rectify the situation than you would if you just started over in the first yeah. place. And then whenever, so when you go do go to the garden center, then of course, make sure you inspect that new plant that you're getting really well, turn over the leaves, make sure you're not bringing any, any pests or anything home with you uh, to start with too. All right. Um, so we've got another one uh, from our, our audience. Awesome. Um, I have a really big rubber tree. This spring, I propagated several babies from it. I you know, enjoyed finding homes for them. What is the best solution for cleaning the leaves? I would just do a damp cloth would be my technique. Chris, what are you going to use on your rubber tree leaves? I was, oh, I was thinking a, <laughs> a mixture of bleach and pledge and, you know, <laughs> ammonia, salts. No, no I, I would say... <laughs> Uh, it would be a damp uh, cloth, just like a dusting cloth, but I'm not going to put any product on it. Um, yeah. yeah, just wipe them down real quick. And Melinda, if it's like a really big tree, like I propagated my rubber tree off of like an actual like tree sized tree, rubber tree, um, uh, try a leaf blower. Maybe that'll work. <laughs> put a fan on it and just yes. let, it <laughs> let it go. But yeah, I would say no, no products. You'll see. Um, I have a florist background as well. So we, we tend to have a lot of uh, flower shops with a product called Leaf Shine. So when a, when a gift basket is going out with, with house plants, you, you tend to see it sprayed a lot with Leaf Shine to give it that shiny, almost see your face in it kind of uh, appearance, which it's designed for that. But you always want to make sure that you're just applying that to the upper surface of the leaf on the underside you're going to have stomata and a lot of breathing pores which you wouldn't want to clog with any type of uh, product so to me stick with the damp cloth and water and that'll give it plenty of shine for sure uh, so our next question is should i leave our, my water sit out for a day before watering my plants so if, if fluorids a concern for you, then you definitely can. Like if you do have that, that um, spider plant that you're trying to water and avoid that, uh, that tip burn, um, a lot of people will do that is they'll fill a jug and then they'll let it sit for uh, a day or two before they actually um, use it. So you certainly can. It's not going to um, kill your plant. It's not going to harm your plant if you use it straight out of the, out of the tap. You might just have a little bit of that brown edge on very sensitive um, house plants. All right, sticking on that water theme, um, soaking banana peels in water, uh, does that do anything as far as adding nutrients or anything for the plants? Mm, man, I have no idea, to be honest. <laughs> I have never tried <laughs> tried that uh, technique. Have Have any of you tried that before? I, I have not. I can't imagine it would add yeah. too much if it's only soaking for a short period of time. Maybe if you put it through a blender or something like that. Uh, yeah, maybe you could add a little organic matter if you blended it up and added it to the the soil, but I wouldn't I don't think just soaking in water would get you to the level of like a compost tea or something like that. I don't yeah, I don't think it would have too much in there. But yeah, hey, you usually usually when you do like a compost tea, you still have to have those microbes mm -hmm. available to help with the breakdown. Uh, to provide those nutrients. And so yeah. I wouldn't think it would have that much positive. Yeah. And I don't know, do people do use compost tea in a house plant, indoor plant? I probably wouldn't recommend that, would you? I would be afraid of the smell. Me too. Yeah. That's kind of what I'm well, thinking. Oftentimes, you know, we use our potting soil. So I wouldn't think that we would have the soil microbes that yeah. we would have outside to be able to break that. Yeah, down. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I would just stick with your traditional kind of house plant fertilizer if you need need some added nutrients. Interesting think, question though. <laughs> I think we have time for for one more question and then we will we'll close out the podcast. So, um, Ken, you want to finish us off? 
Katie, did you say ask the last question? I have blanked. <laughs> no, I slipped. Oh, I okay. flipped them. Katie, <laughs> That's okay. you want to finish this out? <laughs> yeah, Way we'll end with uh, a difficult one. Should we be watering our orchids with ice cubes, like it's Ooh. often told on the that's a, that's a great debate. I've seen I've seen um, articles from extension sources going either way. Um, so I don't know that I can give you a definite yes or no on that in terms of what the research will <laughs> will show you. Um, I will say though that I have done that in the past just to see what would happen, just to see how it would work. Um, and I haven't noticed any adverse effects of doing that if you're only putting those ice cubes on the bark, on the soil uh, mix of the orchid. So you're not gonna take an ice cube and set it on the leaf or have it touching the roots because then that could actually cause some, uh, some damage. Uh, but I have indeed done it in the past and I've had okay success with it. I think the key, like with any other house plan, is just to make sure you're not over or under watering, is that you're really still kind of checking how much moisture is actually in that um, pot of bark mixture before you're um, doing it. Have any of you guys ever used the ice cube technique? I've yeah. used it. It's, it's still one of those things that, I know these are kind of more tropical plants. To me, it just doesn't I mean, this is just me. It doesn't really make sense to put mm -hmm. frozen water on there. To... Right. I know. But yeah. I, I haven't had any issues using it. So my mother-in-law yeah, does it and she's, she lives in the basement with us. So I have to speak quietly, but yeah, <laughs> she, she does it, but I don't think it helps. <laughs> I think it helps her proportion out the correct amount of water. Yeah. I think you're right. Like, I think it does maybe help some people from, putting too much water on, which would be more detrimental, I think, for for orchids. Typically, when I have orchids, I will, because usually they're in their own plastic pot that's set inside kind of a decorative, more decorative pot. So usually I would pull out that plastic pot, take it to the sink, water it thoroughly, let it drain well, and then take it back to the, to the decorative uh, container. That was usually for me a little bit a uh, little bit easier and then you could really see how much moisture was in that entire uh, kind of pot versus just at the at the top yeah I will say as a again as a lazy houseplant horticulturist um, orchids are probably not my my go-to houseplant though I love um, orchids uh, and they can be fairly uh, easy to grow if you have the right conditions. Um, it's sh people struggle with re-blooming them. And the, the key to that I found is a change in temperature. So if you if you have a house plant or a orchid that's in the home 100, 365 days of the year, um, you're gonna have difficult time reflowering it because it's not gonna get much temperature fluctuation from day to night. Your house is gonna be a fairly consistent temperature. So I found the most success when bringing them outside for the summer, growing them on the front porch in a shady spot, and then leaving them outside kind of as long as you can until the temperatures get too low. Because outside they're gonna get a, more of a fluctuation of day and night temperatures, and that's what's gonna induce um, flowering. So it can be done. They're, they're a lovely, lovely house plan if you wanna, wanna do them. It's the benefit of living in an old drafty house. Yeah, there you, you get go. Those, yeah. You get those cold temperatures through the window. That's true. If you got a nice window that's going to have some, <laughs> some cool air coming through, that'll work. <laughs> well, that was a lot of fantastic information about houseplants. And I, I think we are prepared for what this winter brings as we bring our babies inside to live among with us here in our home. So Candace Hart, State Master Gardener Specialist, thank you for so much for being on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I could talk about houseplants any day, so I'm happy to happy to be on. I will book you for the next one then. <laughs> so yeah, I, I would actually, probably a topic of mine I would love to hear is maybe more about floral arranging because that's something yeah. that I need to learn more about that because sure. I, I run out of tricks at home. So got to yeah. impress my wife with something. There you go. And we can talk about growing your own cut flowers too and then making an arrangement with those. Yeah. That is great. So, well, Candace, thank you again. We really do appreciate you having, uh, we really do appreciate you being on the show tonight. <laughs> and um, 
Uh, if folks do have questions about uh, Master Gardeners and their neck of the woods, they can get in touch with their local extension office or uh, with Candace here. We can leave your contact information in our show notes. Yep. Um, the Good Growing Podcast is produced by Wendy Ferguson and is edited by me, Chris Enroth. As always, our co-hosts that are with us here at the Good Growing Podcast, Ken Johnson, Katie Parker, thank you so much for being here. Uh, leading us through the foray of house plants, uh, and we have found ourselves here at the other end. Ken, Katie, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, but especially thank you, Candice. Yeah, thank you, guys. Yes, thank you, Candice, Katie, Chris. Let's do this next week. <laughs> and yes, we, we shall do this again next week. Uh, we're going to be talking with Kelly Alsip about monarch butterfly way stations and about setting those up and creating pollinator habitat in our yards and communities. So, as always, listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or in the case if you're watching this on YouTube, watching. And then you know, folks, what to do. Keep on growing. <laughs>